appreciate if you would do what you have always done and let us know when the recording begins. I sure will. I'm it's, it's queuing up right now. I'm trying to get it set, make sure it's all working. So I'll let you know when it's hot here. So, okay. Let us know when the recording begins. All right, it is online. So, um, it's, it's I'm actually going to wait to start until the top of the hour in, in case there are that people signing in just then. That will be fine. Yeah, that'll work. Here I'm online. I haven't seen it come up yet, so it should be. It takes a, it's about a minute delay, isn't it? Yeah, about a minute delay. Yeah, you, if you refresh right now, it should be there. So. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Yeah, there, there we go. I see it. Here I'm online. I haven't seen it come up yet, so it should be. It takes a, it's about a minute delay, isn't it? Yeah, about a minute delay. Yeah. You, yeah. And is my voice loud enough, folks? Yes. Uh, yeah. I know my vest is loud enough. I decided to be Afrocentric. I'm loving the bow tie. That is great. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Wes McNeese, Executive Director of Diversity Initiatives, Southern Illinois University. Welcome to this evening's Conversation of Understanding. Our topic this evening will be racism, COVID-19, and the SIU system. This is a two-hour virtual discussion, and it's sponsored by the SIU President's Office, and also the Systems Diversity Advisory Council. And we've brought together a group of distinguished, well-informed individuals who will address this topic. Uh, Dr. Lakeisha Butler, Professor of Pharmacy Practice and Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, the SIU Edwardsville School of Pharmacy will both participate as a panelist, but also will moderate this discussion. Todd Bryson, the Interim Associate Chancellor for Diversity SIU Carbondale, will monitor audience questions and Carol Walker is our Zoom coordinator. We want you to stay with us until the end because Dr. Dan Mahoney, the SIU president, will be making closing comments. But for now, Dr. Butler, would you lead us through? Thank you, Dr. McNeese, for that introduction. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It is my pleasure to serve as your moderator for this evening's Conversation of Understanding. We will be discussing the critical and timely topics of COVID-19 and racism. As stated throughout this evening's conversation, please feel free to type your questions in the chat. They will be moderated by Dr. Todd Bryson. As of today, it crushes me to report that according to the CDC, 
We have had more than 400,000 deaths due to COVID-19 and over 25 million confirmed cases in the U.S. This virus has definitely wrecked havoc nationally and globally. Unfortunately, the virus is not impacting all people equally. Blacks, Hispanics, American Indian, Alaskan Natives have had more than two times higher rates than their whiter, white counterparts. More than five times more hospitalizations. But Blacks have been hit the hardest with deaths equaling more than two times the rate compared to other groups. I can recall being asked by some colleagues this past summer, why are these disparities occurring? Is the virus affecting black and brown communities differently because of genetics or other factors? My short answer was race is not a risk factor for COVID-19, racism is. Due to the historical policies and continued practices of this country, such as redlining, federal and state policies resulting in past and present day segregation, under-resourcing of housing and schools, limited access to hospitals, pharmacies, and food deserts, being forced to live, live in areas close to industrial and toxic waste plants that result in higher rates of asthma, which can in fact exacerbate COVID-19 because both affect the lungs. Not having the privilege to work from home during the pandemic due to lack of wealth and limited access to education and employment. Just for your information, Hispanic wealth equals six cents for every dollar of white wealth and black wealth equals five cents for every dollar of white wealth. It is projected to take over 200 years for the wealth gap to diminish. This has originated from free labor of enslavement, lack of equity in homes due to white flight and subprime mortgage loans targeting people of color, and quite frankly, a caste system that was created during the made up construct of race. Also not being adequately cared for when testing positive for COVID-19 due to racism. Individuals being sent home from the hospital to unfortunately die. This was recently documented by the late Dr. Susan Moore, a black physician who died from complications of COVID-19. She states that she was denied appropriate care in an Indiana hospital, likely due to the stereotype that blacks have a higher pain tolerance. Would this stereotype be due to the history of barbaric abuse Blacks have endured? The whippings of sometimes more than 100 lashes by their slave owners for disobeying or trying to run away. Or Black slave women being experimented and operated on without anesthesia by the gynecologist John or J. Marion Sims. These are just a few reasons for these disparities that we're seeing. There is so much more. I didn't even mention the well-known history of the Tuskegee syphilis trial and the well-known Henrietta Lacks. Fast forward to the production of the vaccine candidates and solicitation of clinical trial enrollment. All of what I've just stated and then some has contributed to minoritized groups looking at the COVID-19 vaccine with a serious side eye. I, along with other black healthcare professionals would have conversations asking ourselves, how can we recommend this vaccine to our patients and our communities when we too are in fact hesitant ourselves due to racial trauma and political trauma? This is the reason that the National Medical Association, the largest and oldest organization representing Black physician and other healthcare professionals, created an independent panel in which I'm honored to serve as the only pharmacist to vet the vaccine candidates. 
Since September of 2020, we have met with the FDA, CDC, scientists and manufacturers from Pfizer, Moderna, and others to review the safety data and effectiveness data. Our main focus was the safety data and inclusion of diverse populations in clinical trials. I'm happy to report that both trials for Pfizer and Moderna had about 10% black enrollment and more than about 20% of Hispanic enrollment in their clinical trials. These percentages are much greater than your typical clinical trials, which is great. In the beginning, I provided you with the chilling numbers, the infection and death rates. And so we desperately need a solution to get this pandemic under control. These vaccines were able to be approved for emergency use for that reason, because they are so safe and effective. The most common side effects that were seen during clinical trials is arm soreness and what we call an immune response, which is common with vaccines. Symptoms such as feeling tired, fatigue, chills, headache, possible fever. And what's even more important is that they are over 94% effective against COVID-19 after the second dose. If we compare the effects of the virus to the possible effects of the vaccine, it is definitely night and day. This novel virus has affected individuals in different ways. And there are long-term long effects of the virus that are being discovered, such as possibly affecting the heart, the brain, and the lungs. I have to say that these vaccines have been the most reviewed treatment option in years and have included minority scientists, such as Dr. Kizzy Corbett, a black scientist who was instrumental in the development and production of the Moderna vaccine. Personally, after being privy to all of this information, I was eager to get the vaccine as soon as possible to not only protect myself, but my family and others that I may come in contact with. I took my first dose of the Moderna vaccine three weeks ago and will receive my second dose next week. After the injection, I had arm soreness and felt tired for about two days and that's expected, but was able to complete my work and home duties as normal. I have not had any other symptoms since then. So I've shared a lot, but we have a lot more to discuss. So at this time, I want to offer space to hear from our other esteemed panelists who will continue to offer great insight and knowledge on this topic uh, of the conversation. I would like to introduce Dr. Christopher Smyer. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the SIUE School of Medicine in Springfield. Dr. Smyer. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Um, I really appreciate you giving the historical perspective because as a physician within healthcare, trust is essential to be able to provide adequate care, to be able to manage the patient's concerns, to be able to hear those concerns. And I think because of race and our historical legacy, there's a lot of different reasons that have sort of undermined that trust that we have um, with our physicians, with healthcare in general. And that as providers, we have to take that into account when we're discussing what we know, what we don't know about um, the vaccine and other concepts that we are applying within a medical context to try to optimize um, the patient's health and optimize the ideal outcomes associated with that. I think some concepts that are important to be presented first before getting a, a more in-depth conversation is understanding that in medicine, there's always risk and benefits that are being weighed. There's no intervention that is zero risk, 100% benefit. And so as physicians, we are weighing and trying to maximize the benefits while minimizing the risks and trying to select who the ideal candidates for certain medications or treatment options. Um, and also being able to monitor and sort of have a plan in place if the risks start to occur. With the vaccines, the only contraindication that truly exists is if you have a severe allergic reaction to one of the products in the vaccine and one of the components of it. Otherwise, there's just a conversation that we're having. And in most cases, we're recommending people to get vaccinated 
because as you suggested and already talked about and expressed Dr. Butler, the um, adverse effects from having the vaccine such as arm soreness, fatigue, headaches, chills is a lot better than the adverse out, um, outcomes that we've seen such as death, being intubated and the unknown long-term implications of, of acquiring the virus. That being said, we're also gonna be continuing to understand the vaccine. There's data that's continuing to be collected um, as people get the vaccine so that we can continue to monitor and be proactive in monitoring and assessing for any risks or adverse effects that are happening. One way we do that is that after you get the vaccine, you're monitored for at least 20 minutes before leaving um, the facility. Um, just to make sure if you were to have an allergic reaction, we're there and ready to intervene to abort that process from team. But otherwise, I want to talk about some of the aspects of what it will look like in Spring in Sangamon County. I think in building trust, we have to be transparent about what we do know, what we don't know, um, and sort of where we are as this is an ongoing plan that's evolving to try to meet the needs of our communities. One of the things with the way the uh, programs will be rolled out, one of the things you may notice is that in each of the sites, it may be different because while we are getting vaccines from a federal level to the states, who are then dispersing to the counties, each county is responsible for deciding what is the best way for administering those vaccines that they do receive. And so uh, by SIU being in three separate counties, that rollout may be slightly different in each county. So you wanna be talking to your direct supervisor regarding what the policy looked like. And what I'll be talking about is related specifically to Sangamon County where um, SIU Springfield is located. Um, what we'll be doing here is um, partnering with some of the other healthcare organizations in Sangamon County Health um, System to give people the opportunity to get the vaccine. The way to look is that you are not um, bound to go to one specific clinic site that you get your regular care at. You can go to any of the sites that are offering the vaccine. However, which site you go to for the first vaccine, we're hoping that you'll go back to that same site for your second vaccine in the same way that whether you get Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, we want you to get the second dose of that same brand. Um, this is partly due because of the way the vaccines are administered is that as we use vaccines, we're recording those and that helps us um, put in a new request for more vaccines to ensure everyone is getting their second dose to complete the series. Um, another important thing with these vaccines is that all the studies that were done were done with two doses. And so if you get the first one, while you do get an immune response to get the ideal 94% effectiveness or greater, you have to get both doses. And there's a different time lag between those two doses with the Pfizer being 21 days, Moderna being 28 days. In the studies, they did have people that got the vaccine later than that 28 day period, specifically in Moderna. And so CDC does recommend that it's okay to get it up to 42 days, that it still seems to be effective. And so while we are trying to be as close to that 21 or 28 day period, if you are a little bit later, that is not necessarily a problem, um, but we're hoping to be able to get everyone their vaccine in a timely fashion. Another important thing to point out is that um, we, at, here at SIU, we are very much intentionally trying to make sure that as we think about um, the historical legacy, the things that undermine the trust, that we are trying to regain that trust. Uh, we have a COVID response team that has been very much uh, working to working and partnering with different community organizations such as Abundant Faith, um, the NAACP to do different panels, to do different talks, to do um, screening tests for people in the community so they can know whether they've been exposed and have acquired the virus so that people can have access to that care, have access to that information so that they're not unintentionally infecting other loved ones um, and can receive the appropriate care that they deserve. Another thing to be mindful too is as we get vaccines, we will be making this available to the community. And at this point, the rate limiting step is more on just having a supply of vaccines to administer than necessarily having work flow options in place. And so um, for those who are interested, it is important to, when they become available to sign up for it, but do be patient, understand that we will give what we have and that it may be that we run out and we're waiting for another supply to come in to continue administering vaccines. 
Um, one of the things that the CDC has done, which I think is really helpful in highlighting and understanding the inequity that is in medicine and healthcare is sort of how it has gone about deciding different phases of who will be able to get the vaccine. Um, starting with uh, phase 1A, which is healthcare providers of people in long-term care facilities, and then moving to 1B, which is people that are 75 years and older and frontline essential workers. And a lot of people from um, minoritized backgrounds would qualify in this frontline essential worker group to be eligible to get the vaccine. So it's so important that you're having conversations with your physicians um, to have your questions answered. And also important to understand that um, while there are valid reasons to be skeptical, um, in particular, this past year has given a lot of insight for people becoming aware of different disparities and injustices that have continued to persist in America, and that there are people in positions of power and privilege in all sectors of government and in healthcare who are working to try to ensure that the medications, the tests are being done in equitable ways so that the results are relatable and actually applicable to all people in the country. I think in closing my statements in my opening statement, I just wanna highlight that whenever you do have questions, it's important to ask those questions and also be important to understand that just as you're learning, your healthcare providers are also learning and trying to stay up to date. And so it may be that they, being honest, say, I don't know the answer, but what I can promise you is that we can look it up together to find those answers so that you're able to be confident um, and be reassured about why we're recommending the medication and when we're recommending the medication. Some things you may hear just to be have a clarity about is Typically, if you have been exposed and acquire the virus, we're saying to wait 90 days before getting the vaccine. And that's more of just a distribution and trying to maximize the number of people who can get the vaccine to start becoming immunized. Um, the data seems to suggest that if you are exposed, you naturally will create antibodies and that that tends to last for at least 90 days to prevent reinfection. Another important thing to be mindful of is that we are recommending you not to get the vaccine or not to get other vaccines two weeks prior to the COVID vaccine or two weeks after. And that's just to ensure that you have the best immune response possible um, to the COVID vaccine so that you can be as protected as possible. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Thank you so much, Dr. Smyre. You provided a, a lot of great information. You certainly cleared up a number of myths as well. Um, thank you for, for sharing the differences be, between the, the two vaccines as well as um, you know, utilizing the resources. CDC is definitely a, a great resource for us to use. But ultimately, you know, building trust in those minoritized communities as well. Uh, and discussing the phases. So definitely great information. Thank you for that. At this time, we'll move on to our next panelist. We have Ms. Rianne Greenwald. Greenwald. She is the SIUE Director of Health Services. Rianne. Uh, thank you, Dr. Butler. And um, my story will be a little different. Um, as a healthcare administrator, um, I'd like to share a little bit about college health and COVID. Um, I started my career at SIUE in March of 2003, just days before the CDC announced the SARS outbreak. Um, and originally, um, we put in a pandemic plan by the end of March to address that. Fast forward 17 years and January of 2020, we began to realize the impact of the spread of the coronavirus and the campus began to set up a pandemic um, planning for the COVID. Uh, SIUE created a pandemic team um, that was inclusive of all areas of the campus, as well as a core team of about 10 individuals, including the chancellor and vice chancellor. And we started to meet twice a day. Uh, this team was tasked with understanding the full impact to our faculty, staff, and students, and their families. And as spring break came to an end, the decision to pivot all operations to remote learning was put into place. And this really impacted many of our students. Um, along with core values of health and safety, two words were the theme of every action, grace and understanding. We ensured that the decisions we made reflected a human-centered commitment. And as classes became remote, as resources were evaluated, as students suggested to all the changes, the core asked everyone for grace and understanding. And many students returned to their homes 
um, for remote learning while some remained on campus as their safe space. Students needed technology support and SIUE rose to that challenge. Laptops, hotspots were sent to students in need. Uh, students needed accommodations and tutoring support and we made this happen remotely. We worked with the assumption that we needed to adjust and be flexible to make this transition work. And as we began to support students, the following barriers were recognized. We currently do not mandate medical insurance and this put many of our students at a disadvantage. The real challenge, if they were no longer on campus, they had no access to our office. Mental health conditions were exacerbated by what we called the pandemic related stress. Separation from roommates, classmates, faculty and adult supporters and struggling with virtual appointments that may or may not have been in private spaces. And meeting our mission of education was a barrier as we understood the struggles many experienced. Faculty, staff and students had to compete with resources at home and the class load was increased by the competition of family. We have students who have financial resources that are robust but we have some that are, have zero expected family financial contributions. And so children were learning at home remotely, partners were working remotely at home, and just having internet support was sometimes a challenge. Um, mixed messages outside of the university have been given to our students. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, he's a Canadian writer for The New Yorker. When people in authority want the rest of us to behave, it matters first and foremost how they behave. That is called the principle of legit legitimacy and legis legitimacy is based on three things. Um, first, the people who are asked to obey authority have to feel like they have a voice and that if they speak up, they'll be heard. Second, the law has to be predictable. There has to be a reasonable expect expectation that the rules tomorrow are going to roughly be the same rules as today. And the third is the authority has to be fair and it can't treat one group different than another. We saw that that didn't always happen. Dr. Fauci has already um, been able to speak up now um, and say that, uh, that suddenly public health matters became politicized. Um, and looking back, he has three regrets. One that he did not um, strongly favor mask wearing in the beginning. And unfortunately, I felt the same way. If you weren't a healthcare provider, you probably didn't need a mask. We now know that was a mistake. Um, he also wished that he was um, a better advocate for testing. And while I have been um, heard many times that COVID testing doesn't make you safe, the behavior in preparation of the testing may do that. And then he wished that he was not so critical of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and I think your information, Dr. Butler, and certainly Dr. Smear, we know that that um, vaccine was in development for a very long time. It just happened to match uh, the COVID virus. Um, our students saw mixed messages from outside the campus and struggled just to follow basic instructions of the four W's, washing your hands, watching your distance, wearing a mask, and waiting to expand your bubble. And this may have been the hardest thing for our students. We thought they thrived on electronics, but they craved human interaction. And so as we returned in the spring of 2021, we implemented a re-entry screening test for any on-ground faculty, staff, and student. And the results were amazing. We did about 7,300 tests with about 7,200 negative results and only 47 positives. A positivity rate of 0.64%. Um, much lower than the area that we live in. Surveying our uh, core team, I found the following common things. Educating ourselves in the core so that we could educate the campus community was difficult. Using correct terminology and getting the proper equipment and supplies to folks uh, was a challenge. Discussing the importance of choosing single guidelines of the CDC and IDPH rather than I read this article syndrome. Um, articles were somewhat self-serving and going back to CDC to look at the guidelines um, was a better choice. Just the financial impact of the COVID expenses for not only the university, but for students as well. 
some of them trying to manage um, working still outside of the university and then um, taking care of classes. We did create quite a few training materials and um, safety guidelines. Uh, we did a lot of communication. We had a COVID dashboard and these resources help the campus community keep up with the ever-changing response to the virus, but sometimes they weren't read. And just pivoting work assignments to accommodate remote support um, was a challenge in itself. And uh, supporting student voices and community actions during the periods of social injustice and political unrest in the midst of COVID was a challenge in itself. While we looked at large mass um, gatherings without any uh, face coverings and the COVID impact it had, we had a Black Lives Matter march on campus and we kept our students safe. We asked that they wear masks and they did. And we asked them to have multiple smaller spaced out groups and they did that as well. Um, but still, I know that they would have preferred a, a, a more meaningful, larger gathering. And just the revealed disparities of our faculty, staff and students, many of them being essential workers um, that needed to be on ground every day. Um, people living in multi-generational households and the impact that COVID had on them. And we have many, uh, faculty, staff, and students who are housed outside of um, our county or our campus that are in food deserts. Um, food access was tied to schools and healthcare was tied to employment. And those were both at risk. Um, my frustration, a lack of a federal response plan. I think if 50 states were not vying for resources, there, it would have been less stressful. And just the lack of recognition of COVID mortality and morbidity. Um, this is not a 10 day illness and the impact of family and friends deaths took a toll on many of our students. A prolonged crisis mode for us and our operations um, made many complex issues handled in many complex ways. And finally, just imperfectly planning for an unpredictable future. We did have many successes. Um, we added a mental health counselor for faculty and staff struggling during this time. Um, and we were able to perform many of our duties remotely to many of our surprises. We found creative ways to serve students online. We partnered with camp, uh, across campus to use spaces differently. So between student affairs and academic affairs. And we provided access and affordability for all with regards to providing masks for everyone on campus and free COVID testing, um, whether someone had insurance or not. And I think our town hall Zooms that were held frequently to share information and respond to questions and concerns helped um, show the, the transparency of the core group. And we use that feedback for our next step. Um, our vaccine challenges are many. To address the hesitancy, we need to provide trusting, credible messengers not to tell people to take the vaccine, but rather to give them the information that they need to make an informed decision and be empowered with that choice. I think knowledge is power. The vaccine's been challenged with myths. It was not rushed. It is, it is safe. It doesn't change your DNA. It doesn't give you COVID. Um, there are not severe side effects. As we've all said, there is an immune <laughs> response. And um, I believe that our partnership the health service and Madison County to host vaccine clinics so that we can um, focus on our campus community has been well received. We've also contacted our East Side Health Department and they're coordinating all of our vaccines for our East St. Louis campus. We continue to advocate vaccinating our own campus to eliminate any barriers of getting the vaccine. Um, many of these essential workers, just the time away from work the need of the transportation to get to the vaccine site and just unknown vaccinators um, are sometimes a problem. The vaccine rollout is, is slower than we want and hopefully more vaccine will be released soon. The tier system versus an, versus an open access is a challenge and it's common for viruses to mutate and we don't know if the vaccine will need to be administered annually, but it's appropriate for now. Our implementation team is a cross-divisional persons who are developing messaging for our campus with the latest information. 
And as Dr. Butler knows, um, sometimes that information comes uh, on a daily basis. And um, our hope is the vaccine and mitigations will follow our campus to return in a more robust manner in the fall so that everyone can have the college experience they crave. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rianne, for that information. What I really liked is grace and understanding. And we know that the many changes that we've had to make as students, faculty, staff, administrators on our college campuses, grace and understanding has been much needed. Uh, certainly the, the other piece that you talk about is uh, you know, the, the lessons that you learned. And so turning those losses in, into lessons and most importantly, this information that we're providing is to provide facts and the information that we know in order to empower our audiences to make an informed decision. And so this is certainly to encourage um, individuals to, to make a decision that is best for them. Thank you for that. Next, we'll move to our third panelist. We have a physician of the Student Health Services at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Dr. Melody Ewing. She is also a member of the Board of Directors for the Jackson County Department of Health. Dr. Ewing. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say that my comments are from the perspective of uh, someone who provides primary care directly to pay students, um, as well as my role at the health department. Um, our audience does include, hopefully, um, students, community members, and faculty and staff of all of the campuses. And I'd like to start by um, just acknowledging that um, right now today, we have six students. And we are aware of you. Unfortunately, the vaccine is slow to roll out. Uh, in the news this evening, it uh, said that our government has purchased an additional 200 million doses um, to help uh, get that flow going. We hope that it happens sooner rather than later. Um, how has the pandemic affected our Carbondale campus students in particular? Um, the pandemic has really accelerated uh, the historical healthcare inequities that do exist in our society. Um, when barriers such as racism, poverty, a lack of access to quality and culturally aware healthcare intersect, the affected groups do have poorer health outcomes than the majority groups. Uh, students attending the Carbondale campus often require uh, or must have outside employment, either part-time and for some of the students, full-time. Uh, these funds are used to support uh, their daily needs. And in addition, many of our students do send money home to support their family that they've left to attend college. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, many of these jobs are on the front lines. They have a lot of contact with the community. Um, and not working is simply not an option for them. They have to. Um, purchasing your own uh, personal protective equipment earlier on uh, was a challenge also. Um, masks were available, but you had to buy them out of your pocket because some employers just simply couldn't access them or they just didn't supply them. Um, so basically, um, these financial pressures have just continued to be an issue. Um, it's common for these students also in order to save money, live in dwellings that have multiple roommates. And one roommate will come home with it and then it spreads through the entire house. Those students are then in crisis because no one's making any money because they're all out ill. Um, and then the vaccine hesitancy um, that takes place in these communities places the students at even higher risk. So while we're waiting for vaccines to become available to the 18 to 24 year old age group, everyone still needs to continue to be as safe as they possibly can, uh, minimize traffic in and out of their apartments, um, have roommate meetings uh, with what the expectations are for the households. Um, in particularly the hesitancy that I've been seeing in my clinic on the Carbondale campus, um, generally is with our minority students. And I'm considering our minority students, the largest number we have are African-American students. We have Latinx students. And in particular, we have a pretty good population of international students. Many of these students have come from formerly, formerly colonized countries, um, third world countries, where their experience with the healthcare system has either been non-existent or they've had uh, some of the negative experiences that many of the minorities in this country have. 
Uh, the, the Latinx students, many of them have ancestors that have come from the Caribbean islands and South America, and they also have had uh, challenges with discrimination and racism in the healthcare system. Uh, so basically what we are trying to do is educate, educate, and educate with the recognition that students, even if they're of the same race, have different uh, lifetime experiences. Um, the practice of oral history telling in families of color is very, very common, but um, your experience may be different from one state to another from which the family originally came. So we are trying to impress upon everyone seeing these patients and interacting with the students that don't make assumptions. Um, some students are extremely hesitant. Few are excited and looking forward to getting their vaccine, which is of course uh, troublesome, um, but we need to be aware of this and we need to address it um, head on. Um, we need to acknowledge that these students have concerns that are valid and the key to, to addressing these concerns is as has already been mentioned uh, with respect, uh, with understanding, making sure that we do not discount any of the fears the students may have, uh, whether we see them as um, not valid or um, annoying or any of the things that you hear people saying. Um, this aversion of the healthcare system um, is something that we have to continuously work on. I have seen in the years that I've been working, hesitancy not just to COVID vaccination, but to many other vaccinations. Um, students will frequently say to me when I ask, oh, do you wanna talk about what your concerns are? The number one thing I hear is, my parent or my grandparent told me not to get that shot. Um, when I press them on, you know, what's behind that? Uh, many of them, the college students these days are not aware of specific incidents in the past that have taken place that most of us are aware of um, as you mentioned earlier, um, they just know that their family has taught them from birth to be leery of the healthcare system. Um, and we need to be comfortable addressing and educating the students on what these past incidences were um, to educate them and to explain why we have safeguards in place now so that we can limit those experiences happening again. Uh, so also recognizing to that uh, the international students also may have some different cultural issues going on that the African-American and Latinx students are not having that were born and raised here in the United States. Um, what we're doing at the health department is of course, um, trying to get as many vaccination doses as possible. Um, of course, we are waiting just as everyone does. You're told how many uh, you're going to get in your shipment, but when you open your shipment is when you really find out how many you have. And frequently those numbers don't match. Uh, we've run into the challenges of, of course, um, scheduling, and then the vaccinations aren't available. The vaccination is not available. So the frustration that I think we're seeing here in our county is that um, appointments aren't available for those who do qualify, feel that they qualify. Um, but as soon as the vaccines arrive, the clinics are then set up. One thing that is helpful right now though, is the college population tends to be 18 to 24, sometimes a little bit older. Most of those folks right now are not in the 1A and 1B group, so we're okay. But those that want their vaccination want it now, and those that don't want a vaccination will frequently say, I'm not getting one even when they are available. So I think we have to maintain contact with both the students, the faculty and staff, as well as the community. In our town, in Carbondale, the university is really the driving force of the town. Uh, so I think we particularly have to be aggressive with working with our local um, healthcare system and health department to make sure that uh, we provide them with any support that they might need. And one thing that's really key also is that we've been holding our vaccination clinics on campus. For many townspeople, campus is a frightening place. These large sparkling buildings, they're too intimidated. We need to support our communities and go out into the communities with the local healthcare uh, system to support their efforts to provide vaccinations to our, our citizens of color. Thank you, Dr. Ewing for that information. And I, and I want to just echo what your statement of not discounting feelings, uh, certainly, mm -hmm. You bring up the, um, the feelings of, of minoritized students of just saying that my parents, my grandparents told me not to take 
the vaccine. And that is a result of socialization. And I know I can certainly relate to that as well. Socialization plays an important role in the decisions that we make. And so unpacking that is, is important. And you, you talk about educating, uh, sharing the, the factual information so that uh, the students then can certainly understand more about why their, their parents and grandparents may be sharing those um, particular directives. Wonderful. Let's move on. Uh, before we go into our questions, certainly if you have any questions that have come up throughout our discussion, do not hesitate to place them in the chat. But right before we get into our Q&A, I would like to introduce our next panelist, and that is uh, Dean Cruz, and he is the Dean, D Jerry Cruz is the Dean and Provost of the SIU School of Medicine. Dean Cruz. It, uh, thanks, Dr. Butler. Um, it was great to hear the presentations, uh, all very good. I might have a few comments about them because I'd like to uh, emphasize some of the things that you've said. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, focus on some solutions and practical action steps that, uh, that can be done. And as a Dean and Provost of the School of Medicine, also the CEO of our 280 physician uh, multi-specialty group practice, I'm gonna kind of go with the broad perspective that informs my decisions when some of these things are, are made. So uh, we'll, we'll go that direction. And um, I will talk about proximity and uh, power. And I'd like you to remember this quote as we go through the presentation. Uh, the dream of reason did not take power into account. More on that later. So I am a family physician uh, by trade and I have a degree in, uh, ep in public health and I have practiced some clinical epidemiology as well down through the past. So um, this pandemic has been of uh, great interest to me. All through my career, uh, my, my goal has been with my colleagues to improve healthcare, health, well-being uh, for everyone. And to do that through lowering the cost of healthcare with better healthcare outcomes a universal access for everybody through an enjoyable system of care. Uh, it's a, a pretty big task, I think. Uh, I will say that in the, the years 2004 and 2005, a lot of information came to us through the work of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, and the Dartmouth Institute, which showed us the characteristics of effective healthcare systems. It's like, okay, now we can really go because we understand uh, you know, what really is effective and there are no more secrets. But it was disappointing during that time. The years 1998 through 2008, I call the decade of shame for American medicine. Because during that 10 year period of time, relative to the rest of the world, our healthcare costs soared, the gap got bigger. Our population-based uh, healthcare outcomes declined relative to the rest of the world, especially for women of childbearing age and children, worse in that category than any other and the access continued to be dismal in the US. So we ask our question, ourselves the question, why? why? Why is this happening? Why is it not getting better? Uh, we all struggled with that. I think all of us uh, came around over the last 12 years or so to understand that virtually all of these negative effects on the health and healthcare system have been due to racism, uh, big problems in health equity. Uh, we, we know that access to care is worse for people of color and for marginalized populations. Delivery of care is substandard across the board for people of color and marginalized populations. It's racism at work. Then COVID-19 came. And I'll also quote uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Early on, he said, COVID-19 shined a bright light directly on the inequities in health due to racism in this country. And that, that light is shining directly on the high infection rate, shining directly on the poor outcomes, and now shining directly on the vaccine hesitancy too. Um, I'll, I'll repeat something uh, Dr. Butler said. Uh, I'll say this myself, racism and not race is the risk factor for these inequities, for the disparities in outcomes, and for the vaccine hesitancy. Racism is the risk factor, race is not. So um, racism works through a power structure that perpetuates inequities and racism accounts for the trust that was lost and defines vaccine hesitancy. 
And I think all of the speakers have said something about trust or trust that was lost. So I'm gonna focus on that one for a minute, trust. Now here's a basic principle. Because of racism and the power structure that upholds it, trust has been lost and must be earned back. It, it has to be earned back and we have to give effort to that. That's a solution, but it's a hard one. I think um, most everybody knows about uh, Brian Stevenson, his book, Just Mercy, the movie, uh, the TED Talk. Uh, he has four steps to change the world uh, relative to racism. Uh, one, learn to be uncomfortable. A lot of the work is uncomfortable. Two, stay hopeful, and I'll, I'll say more about that later. Three, very important, change the narrative to the truth. For example, drug addicts are not criminals. Change that narrative, you know. And the fourth one, get proximate. The change we need is impossible by working at a distance. So at, for proximity, we, over the last few years at the SIU School of Medicine, we are beginning to learn about that on a variety of fronts. Uh, one of them, it was through our hotspotting program where identif we identified the most vulnerable patients, focused on them. From that, we learned how to evaluate communities, the Enos Park Project. Uh, from that, we developed a community health worker program, which grew into the pandemic health, work care, health worker program. Community health workers, medical students, faculties, faculty members, our partners were getting more and more proximate. They were becoming allies on the ground with the people that they needed to, where trust needed to be developed. They learned to listen, to let them lead, and to get together. Now, I'm, I've got a few books here. This is one that I, that I just read, Humankind, A Hopeful History. I'm not much for book covers myself. <laughs> um, uh, and, and this was uh, written by Rutger Bregman. Um, and I'll read a, just a really short segment on page 361. And he's speaking of racism in the United States and South Africa and wrote this, quote, Looking back on the most hopeful shifts in recent decades, we see that trust and contact were instrumental every time. Trust and contact were instrumental every time. Um, you know, that, um, that just emphasizes what I said before. Get proximate, listen, listen some more. Let those who have lost the trust take the lead. Follow, follow more, get together, make friends, be allies. I will say that is the only thing that will improve access. And it's the main thing that will improve vaccine hesitancy. Now it does take time, but we're in this for the long haul. You know, I doubt that we're gonna have just one year of vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> I would doubt that for sure. So I think we need to get really get on with those long-term solutions. Um, now here's another one. This, this book was written in 1982. This is The Social Transformation of American Medicine by Paul Starr. There, there's not much about racism there in there, but there's a lot about power structures. So this is the introduction to the book, The Social Origins of Professional Sovereignty, Sovereignty the first words of the book. The dream of reason did not take power into account. We all have to learn that. The United States is organized by a perfect power structure to keep people in their place. The more color in your skin, the lower your place. At best, this, this power structure is, a man, is manifest in a caste system, um, an invisible backbone that insidiously directs our society. And Dr. Butler mentioned that. I think uh, she said caste system that is a product of a made up construct of, of race, right? For example, mass incarceration is the result of intentional policy. True. So that brings up this book. Here's the book, Cast. Whoops. I don't, I'm, I'm only a third of the way through this. It was written this year, published this year by Isabel Wilkerson. And I just want to read a little bit about Cast. Cast is insidious and therefore powerful because it is not hatred and it is not necessarily personal. It is the worn grooves of comforting routines and unthinking expectations, patterns of a social order that have been in place for so long 
that it looks like the natural order of things. It's the autonomic, unconscious, reflexive response to expectations from a thousand imaging inputs and neurological societal downloads that have fixed people to certain roles based on what they look like and what they historically have been assigned to and the characteristics and stereotypes by which they have been categorized. No ethnic or racial category is immune to the messaging we all receive about hierarchy and thus no one escapes its consequences. That's about very powerful implicit manifestations of abuse of power. When it goes to the extreme, it becomes racism and it is overt. So to address power, our institutions, we need to look at ourselves and our institutions must change our culture and change the narrative and develop a common language. And I think that's happening across the SIU system. I hear about the various anti-racism committees frequently. They're looking at policies and procedures, committee membership, governance structure, and all of those things that, that define the power system. Another way to address this is through events with dialogue and learning. So I wanna mention one from the SIU School of Medicine. We have every year an annual uh, Kinnebrew lecture and forum. This year will be our, our fifth. It's named a Kinnebrew after Alonzo Homer Kinnebrew. And uh, I'll read this from the flyer. The Alonzo Homer Kinnebrew MD lecture and forum on health inequities and disparities is an annual discussion of the health disparities and other factors that impact population health. It commemorates the life of a groundbreaking central Illinois physician. Last year, our speaker was Cameron Webb who ran for Congress, didn't make it, but now is a top advisor on COVID to President Biden. Uh, Dr. Elamine and the rest always get some good speakers here. This time, this year, on February 9th and February 10th, our speaker is Joya Creer Perry from Mount Sinai. She is a birth equity, she's from, with the Birth Equity Collaborative, and I can talk about birth equity for hours and hours. If you want, want me to, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, anyway, the name of her talk is this, Trust, Truth, and Anti-Racism. Exactly what we're talking about. So I, you know, I'll just say that uh, being proximate, changing the power tr structure, uh, that's a way to build trust. And I think we'll learn a lot from, from uh, Dr. Creer Perry, Perry, uh, Perry actually. Um, uh, at 5 p.m. on Tuesday, February 9th is her lecture. The forum is on Wednesday, February 10th at 9 a.m. And we'll send out more information on this because I think she'll, she'll bring you know, fabulous information, a fabulous dialogue and fabulous learning to help us institutionally and systemically to address, address these, these problems. So uh, one last thing, um, uh, Dr. Smyer mentioned the COVID response team, our equity response team. Those things are so important for organizations. It's in action, it works every day. Every day it works, amazingly. A safe haven of support and investigation, it's active. And uh, it's, uh, it's laying the groundwork for the culture change that we need to combat things such as COVID-19 as we move into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz. We appreciate your, your statements. Um, I definitely want to highlight some of the, the things that you mentioned about being uncomfortable. Um, so this work is not comfortable. Um, we, we don't expect you to feel comfortable because it's going against the norm, certainly disrupting the status quo. And so you have to lean into that discomfort. And you talk about listening. Listening is so important. You know, when we think about as healthcare professionals, uh, we have to, to listen to our patients, but we also have to listen to our colleagues, listen to our students. What are they experiencing? Listen with understanding and versus listening to respond. You mentioned changing the narrative to the truth. We have to back that up with facts so that we understand that this, the narrative of what's going on right now oftentimes is not known or it's different from what is reality because we don't, we've, been, we've um, covered up the history of our country and it's been intentional. 
And the, I like the getting proximate as well. Um, so, so my question for, for you as a white male in a position of power, you talk about allyship. So how have you personally worked to become an ally? What personal work have you done to become an ally? I'll, uh, I'll just say that all of this develops over a long, a long period of time. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a, an area in central Missouri that's called Little Dixie. You know, it's one of the two Little Dixies in the United States, southeast Oklahoma, and the counties on both sides of the Missouri River as it, as it flows through the state of Missouri. And um, I will just say that uh, step by step by step, it's, it's, it's been, uh, you know, uh, a way of starting, uh, starting to have understanding about the things that are going on. It, it, it did take me a while to learn how to listen. Uh, I was uh, indeed uh, changed by the training that we did for dismantling systemic racism by Crossroads that Dr. McNeese and John Record initially, I think, uh, brought in to uh, SIU School of Medicine, and it's been perpetuated now through our, our, our programs. So I will just say this. So as a leader, the programs that are developed are that, that form of allyship. So I depend on good people to, to do those things and to show me how I can be an ally. <laughs> so our Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Wendy Alamine, has been my instructor. Uh, in the last few years when, uh, when I've grown the most. I will also say that when I was chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine, and we started the programs of hotspotting and, and then the, the evaluating specific, uh, specific communities and the proximity where other people got, I actually got in positions of allyship at leadership levels. They just came naturally, uh, you know, as a, as a matter of fact. I, I try to be more and more uh, intentional about it and think about it. And it's nice to have the term, uh, really. Uh, and it, uh, it, it reminds me of the things that, uh, that need to be done. Um, but I do, I do try to make decisions and be intentional as an, as an ally when the big decisions are made that are, for example, drawing up our strategic plan and de developing anti-racism uh, task force. I think, you know, those, those things are kind of the, <laughs> some of the uh, executive uh, allyship moves. Oh. Can't hear you. Okay. My apologies. I think what's important as it relates to allyship is we don't give, or you don't give yourself that, that particular title someone else gives you that title, who you are actually being an ally for. And you mentioned something critical that you are, you have an instructor, you have someone that you're, you're learning from. But I think another piece to that is you have provided us with some resources that are great. And so you're doing the own interpersonal work as well. CAST is an excellent book. We're reading that as a part of our um, anti-racism task force, uh, the, the um, core committee. And it, it shines light on so many particular things that um, you know, we, we don't necessarily think about as it relates to racism. So thank you for that as it relates to allyship. I wanna go back to a couple of questions that we have received from our audience. Um, this is directed at Dr. Smyer. Um, so Dr. Smyer, will this county level distribution mirror societal racism? What is the likelihood that persons of color will be treated as second priority in the distribution of the vaccine? So I think um, how we can try to mitigate the racist um, interactions that people have on an individual level can sometimes be addressed in certain policies. And so one way of looking at that is looking at within the CDC of sort of who has been assigned available for getting the vaccine, what group has been made available. So at this point, we're in like a 1A, 1B. And so the 1B is sort of where we see people in the community tending to be in 
um, minoritized demographics, such as our grocery workers, our teachers, who are now able to get the vaccine because they are now in the category that is made available. Um, and so I think that is one way in which you have a larger subset of people who are available. Now within that subset, who decides that they want to get the vaccine, who is gonna be active and advocating for themselves? You do see the historical um, legacy of power and privilege and access and resources and how to navigate um, play out with some people being more intentional of calling every day or more intentional of sort of making sure that they're um, available once it is made available or on board already because they haven't had experiences that have caused them to distrust the healthcare system. And so I think to mitigate that, um, the more that people are educated, the more that people feel empowered, the more that people are talking with their healthcare providers or doctors or practitioners to make sure that they feel comfortable once they are now eligible for it, the more likely they are gonna be able to say like, hey, I would like to get this vaccine. And so for those who are interested, having an ongoing conversation with your healthcare doctor, sort of checking in periodically, unfortunately, all systems are sort of dependent on having a supply to administer. And so as we get more, we will provide more. And I know specifically in Sangamon County, the way it will be done is that Sangamon County Public Health Office will get the bats. They will then reassign it to the other healthcare organizations and sort of divide it up. And then each organization is able to now administer to any patient. You don't have to be a specific patient at that specific clinic site to get it. You just have to be a patient who expresses interest and signs up for when the vaccines are being administered and gets on the schedule. And so, yes, that is a historical legacy. And I'm not trying to say that there's an easy way to completely mitigate it, but I think the more empowered you are and understanding this is a right that you have access to and knowing sort of what demographic you follow within to be eligible so that you know once it's made available to you, you can go talk to your doctor um, to find out how to sign up will be the best way of making sure that you are not put at the back of the line. Because essentially the goal of the CDC is to mitigate the morbidity mortality. And what we have with the data and the facts are that being a minoritized individual increases the risk of morbidity and mortality. So you are a higher priority by virtue of being a minoritized person. And so in some ways you have now been given some privilege that sort of accounts and acknowledges this historical um, disparity from the socializations of racism. That's definitely true. I think something to take into consideration are, are those patients that unfortunately don't have insurance or do not have a, a healthcare provider. Um, Dr. Cruz, did you want to speak on that? Oh, I didn't want to interrupt you. I just wanted you to know that I did have a comment. So if, you, if you'd like to finish, go ahead. Okay, so definitely. Um, uh, Dr. Smyer, did you have any any thoughts on on that? I know just recently, or maybe a couple of months ago, um, some students and I went out to an East St. Louis uh, homeless clinic and provided free flu vaccines. And many of the patients were um, minoritized individuals, but many of them did not have a, a healthcare provider. And so, in that particular case, I think the importance of being proximate. So us getting out to provide the vaccine to those individuals. Um, but the other thing I wanted, maybe if Rianne, you can talk about the SIUE upcoming website as it relates to links and providing information on where one might be able to, to get the vaccine. Um, so just to follow up on one um, issue, you know, a lot of people that are going to be um, perhaps underserved in the medical community may not even have computers. And so this idea of everyone has access to sign up is pretty frustrating because there are many people, especially the first one A's, um, the elderly, I, you know, I'm not sure who signed them up. I, I'm hoping someone helped them um, and they, they didn't get lost in the system. Uh, what Dr. Butler is talking about, our group has gone through and identified many of the surrounding areas um, that have opportunities for signing up. So understanding that not all of our students um, and faculty and staff actually live in Madison County. They may live St. Louis County, St. Louis uh, City, 
um, St. Clair, Monroe, wherever. And so we have gone through and linked all of the different health department sites. Um, unfortunately, Madison County had uh, a high number of people sign up for the survey, which was to tell Madison County who was interested in the vaccine and what their tier would be. And so they've actually shut that off. And so now what will happen is, uh, along with other sites, there will be a scheduling system. And that really has come through with the eye care um, program so that um, it's, tiers are still identified. If you meet a criteria, um, it will get clicked into an actual uh, schedule. But if you're not, you're going to have to go back. And so it's that um, not one and done issue that I think is, is disturbing because perhaps someone has has gone to uh, an area to get a computer, to get signed up. They're not um, actually correct uh, tier yet. And so they've lost that opportunity. They'll have to go back again. And um, I, I think we just need to take that into consideration. Everybody doesn't have an iPhone. Everybody doesn't have a, an Apple watch and everybody doesn't have a computer at their, you know, beck and call. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, we've talked about how COVID-19 has shown a light on the many uh, injustices and inequities in our country. Um, and, you know, we talk about the vaccine potentially getting us back to normal. Well, we don't want to go back to that normal, right? We want a new normal and really implementing what we've learned from, from this particular pandemic. Dr. Cruz, I did have a question for you and you did say you, you had something you, you wanted to share, but um, the question is from the audience, can you define allyship as you understand it? Well, uh, Dr. Butler, I think you, uh, <laughs> you, you defined it uh, very well. And uh, I really hadn't thought of it this way, but you don't give yourself that title. You know, it, it comes from others. And I think it, 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 it means being aware, understanding, uh, actively trying to determine the factors that lead to these various inequities. And then being, as I mentioned before, like the COVID, equi the equity response team, being a safe haven of support and investigation. And I say investigation because I think that's important because that shows that you are trying to change the system as well as supporting and being a friend and getting together. You know, that point is made in chapter 17 of that book, Humankind, A Hopeful History. It, it really is a fascinating book, quite frankly, written by a Dutch author. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, 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 that's, that's what I would say in answer to that question. Hey, I'll, I'll say one other thing that I was going to say before too, as Dr. Smyer was answering his question. Just before this conversation of understanding started, I was on the phone with one of uh, the organizational healthcare leaders here in, in Springfield. And so the SIU School of Medicine, the Springfield Clinic, uh, Memorial Health System and a Hospital Sisters Health System St. John's with the Sangamon County Health Department are working as five organizations to make sure that the vaccine distribution is good. With this healthcare leader, he actually brought up about how we're gonna get the, the vaccine sites to uh, areas where marginalized populations are. And we had a discussion about, well, some areas might be different because the hesitancy might be based on issues related to immunization. And in others, it might be historical. And others, it might be for lack of insurance, which getting insurance is actually a trust issue itself, we learned, strangely enough. Uh, and I will tell you, that, you know, the systems that have been built over, you know, some years here, uh, that, that conversation would not have happened four or five years ago, that, that I could have that with that leader. So I, I just wanted to emphasize, uh, emphasize that too. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, so we've had a couple of other resources. I know Dr. Cruz talked about Just Mercy, CAST, and um, a few others. 
Uh, but from the, the audience, we have a recommendation for Biased by Jennifer Eberhardt, um, which is another book that uncovers hidden prejudice, if I can speak today, prejudices. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. I think it might be good if we, we transition back to the COVID-19 uh, vaccine a little bit. Um, so we've talked about that we have Pfizer and Moderna, both of those vaccines available and when you actually are to receive it. Can uh, one of our panelists talk about how the vaccine actually works? Sure, I can talk about that. So I think one of the best ways of thinking about the way this vaccine works is sort of understanding what our body does normally to fight off viruses and other things that keep us healthy. Normally, if you were to be exposed to a virus, your body recognizes that and then it starts to build up um, antibodies to be able to fight it off so that if it was to happen again, you're better prepared to address it and so you're less likely to get um, sick from it. Instead of having the full virus attack, um, the vaccine basically tells the body how to do some simulations and make a certain protein that sort of allows the body to know what to look for. And so it'd be no different if you brought in a consultant to say, hey, if this happens, or here's a hypothetical that could happen, if you see this, this is how you should respond. This is how you should navigate to get out of the situation safely. And then after they've done their consulting and instruction, they leave and go on. And that's similar to what this vaccine does. When you get it, the mRNA goes into some of the cells that tell it how to make the right protein that your body needs to be able to recognize quickly to fight off the virus. And then the mRNA itself that gave those instruction gets broken down by the body natural immune system so that it's out of your system in two to three days. And so in summary, the way the vaccine works is it gives it, you're injected, it tells the body what it needs to make in order to be able to identify the right um, in proteins or right types of cell surfaces that the virus would look like so that it's prepared to respond to that. And then it breaks down and goes away. And you have that um, antibodies that are built up to sort of last for protection. And we don't know how long those antibodies will last in your system, which is when people are talking about getting a booster. Because if you start with 100 antibodies, maybe you're exposed and it uses up 60 of them, you're down to 40, over time that gets worn down. And so we may see that in a few years, you need a booster to sort of boost that number back up for protection. But essentially that is what this vaccine is doing. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Smyer. Uh, so when we think about the SIU system, is there any one thing that SIU can do uniformly across all campuses as, as regards to COVID-19? Any thoughts on that question? I'll comment. Um, I think it's to come from the very top that um, there's an expectation that every single campus will put forth all effort possible to make sure that we're addressing the needs, um, educational needs, as well as access for all the minority students uh, to this vaccine as soon as it becomes available. Um, we need to be present in the conversations that take place in our local health departments or many of you are in the state capitol um, to advocate for uh, the minority populations that we have in our colleges as well as the community. Um, when that comes from the top, people will listen. Um, I think we already know that our leadership is very much committed to um, all of our students and we need to carry that message uh, out there to our communities. Do any other comments from the panelists? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Butler, I'd, I'll just say that um, the, the leaders at the various uh, campuses have a meeting with uh, President Mahoney every week and um, we've shared information. And I know that, uh, you know, a lot of the things on the various, of the, on the, the campuses are not uniformly identical, but I think we developed some, some common foundations. Uh, you know, the School of Medicine is officially part of SIU Carbondale, but I've had 
lots and lots and lots of uh, conversations and meetings and discussions with Chancellor Pembroke uh, that have been very fruitful. I mean, I, I've learned, uh, you know, an astounding amount that's been helpful in, in, in what I'm doing. So I would just say that, that right now the communication across the system is operating at a very high level. That's the feeling that I get. Thank you for that. Um, so once again, we're, we're talking about COVID-19 and racism in the SIU system. So as it relates to, to, to racism, we certainly have a number of initiatives on our campus and uh, we've seen improvement on, on our campus. We are having more conversations. But when we can reflect on where we are today, there is certainly room to grow. So my question for the panelists is for one, why are we still experiencing health disparities? I, I can remember um, that health disparities were first discovered in 1979. So that's over 40 years um, ago. And so why are we still experiencing these health inequities in our country, these health disparities in our country? And we talk about racism, um, but it, it's, we still see these events just like January 6th and, and I'm sure there will be more events as well. Can you talk about why are we still seeing uh, the, the potential lack of resolution or mitigation of health inequities and health disparities? So I'll start with that. Um, part of my training and background not only was in medicine, but I also have a master's uh, from the University of Chicago Divinity School, focused in theological ethics. And within that study of talking about how we think about God, the divine, how do we think about right and wrong, there's a framework um, that I really appreciate it, where it talks about norms sort of being something that continue on a trajectory. And insofar as that norm can be recognized by others, it gives legitimacy to it. And so when those norms are legitimized, then they seem reasonable. And so an easy classic example, um, as a physician, you have to get informed consent, which means a patient can refuse a procedure or an option, an intervention. They just have to have a reasonable explanation for why and how that aligns with their values. Um, now, who defines what is reasonable and how much do you inquire before you're satisfied is up to the physician and thus reinforces the power dynamic of the physician and the patient. But what we see classically, if, if someone was a Jehovah Witness, for example, and they're having a surgery and you say you're going to be losing blood because of surgery, we expect that. If your life was to be threatened, would it be OK for us to give you blood? And they say, no, I'm a Jehovah Witness because that religion has been legitimized and the norms of not taking blood is seen as um, normal within that religion and legitimate you don't ask more and say, oh, they're just a Jehovah Witness. That makes sense. That's a pattern I can recognize as legitimate, no further in questions. But they just said no. And when you ask why, they're like, you know, I don't want someone else's blood in me. You will have more hesitancy to be okay with that without pressing a little bit more to make sure they fully understand what is at stake, fully understand the true risk, fully understand the likelihood of them losing blood. And I think that same thing applies when we talk about these other norms of racism and other ideologies around what is microaggressive, implicit bias. And while for certain subsets of people, those norms are recognized and legitimate, for others, they are unaware of. And so when we look at um, the events such as the murder of George Floyd, for a large number of people, that was a normalized that, yes, I can believe a police officer would do that. Yes, I've heard stories. Yes, that is a pattern of engagement that is legitimized that I've, I've seen it happen. So I'm not shocked or surprised. But for others, they were horrified. And it was like, oh my God, who would harm someone that is not threatening, not doing anything wrong? How could this happen? And so I think while we are seeing progress in the conversation, the reason why you may still see a lag is because these new norms that people are now discussing and learning and internalizing have not been legitimized and recognized enough by enough people to now reset that as the new norm of how we engage. In the same way that Dr. Cruz mentioned, he's having new conversations with other healthcare organization leaders that were not being had four or five years ago. And so the goal and hope is to continue to have these dialogues, to continue to legitimize, to continue to seek legitimization, not only from those in power, but from our peers and community, because at the end of the day, 
as we go and engage these communities, we have to reset the power dynamic of placing them in positions of power to affirm, to give credence to what we're doing, to say, yes, this is helpful for me and my community, or no, this is not helpful. These are my questions that I want answered. These may not be the things that they prioritize. And insofar as we can redistribute that power to equalize it and set that as a new norm where minoritized patients and individuals can expect to be treated with dignity, can expect to be heard the first time and seen as a legitimate request and concern, it would then create a different dynamic in how we engage each other, which leads to better health outcomes, which leads to less stress, leads to this idealized future that we're hoping and aspiring to. But all of that resetting takes time and investment to engage and build the allyship and partnership. Definitely said a mouthful. Thank you for, for providing that insight. That was wonderfully stated. Dr. Cruz? Yeah, Dr. Smyre, that was great. I, you know, I, I just like to give a couple of short examples. Um, so when uh, we, we tried to do uh, some outreach into the community for maternity care to address the problem that I mentioned, the real gap in the United States for uh, care of women of childbearing age and children uh, um, twice. I got a response at the table. Our door is open to everyone. There's no access problem here. We take anyone who comes through our door. See, that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem. The problem is the issue of trust that needs to be built and the issue of being proximate and, and getting out and and doing the thing, doing those kinds of things, you know, it it it's um, there. There's a lot of work to be to be done there. Now, I, I will say that I, you know, I had a 31 year career as an SIU family physician practicing, uh, and I haven't uh, for a while, for a while, about six years. You know, I haven't, haven't seen patients for that that period of time. But, you know, I will say that uh, the feeling is different now. It's like something is happening different I've, to a greater degree than I've ever felt before. But guess what? I also feel the pushback to a greater degree than I've ever had before. The resistance to understanding those things that need to be understood to overcome health access and delivery inequities and uh, disparities in outcomes. It's true. I, you know, I, I, I think virtually every physician I, that I've ever s s been involved with who's uh, seen something about disparities in the delivery of care said, well, I don't, I don't do that. And I would have said that too about my, my practice. But, uh, you know, as time's gone, gone on, looking back on it without really even recalling any specific, specific events, I am sure that I did the same thing. And I'm sure that virtually every physician does. And we've got to come to the re realization of that somehow in order to change it. It's slow and it, it, it's a big process. Absolutely. Uh, this is actually a question for uh, all of the panelists. You know, we, we talked about earlier, I believe Rianne talked about um, some of the challenges with the previous administration and the um, choices that were made, missteps that were made. Um, but let's just say we have a new administration now and there are some changes that are being implemented as it relates to COVID-19. And so the question is, let's imagine that you were leading the pandemic response team right now. What would be your top two to three priorities especially for minoritized populations. And that question is for any of the panelists. Um, I'll start. Um, my first priority would be um, education. And that's not necessarily about the vaccination, education about health healthcare, how to access it, and how to advocate for yourself. Um, my second priority would be, of course, then access. Making sure that what the patients need is where they need it to be. 
not where it's convenient for us to supply what they need. And then the third priority would probably be um, providing reassurance and encouraging those to spread the word among their community that they've had an experience that's good and it is possible. Dr. Ewing, any other responses? Um, I'd just like to piggyback off of Dr. Ewing. I, I think those are three excellent um, ideas. I, I think part of the issue is communication. And um, many times when we communicate, I know I do, I do it in my charting manner. So I, you know, here are the facts, boom, boom, boom. Instead of taking time to say, um, here's what I think is going on. And here's what I think are some options and then getting feedback enough that says uh, that's correct, or perhaps that's not correct. Maybe that's not why people are not following the rules or feel like they you know, are, are, are not connected to healthcare. So I think sometimes communication and in all sorts of mediums, not, not just electronic. I know we have lived in a remote world for almost a year now, but Again, there are many people that do not have this opportunity to pull up a YouTube or to um, access something remotely. And so I, I think we need to make sure that we're going to them. So if, if a church is a trusted um, venue, perhaps a, a, you know, a church nurse or a, um, a, a clinic or something that would tie them to their community. So again, the proximity, you're going to them rather than them coming to us. And then just um, trying to give facts. Uh, many times uh, you will hear, I saw this article or I heard this um, talking head rather than here are the experts. Um, it, it's, it's amazing how people will take, and I hate the term fake news, but they will take something they've heard someone's opinion, and then turned that into, that's an absolute, and it's not. So um, I would add uh, to your three, which I think are excellent, uh, communication and facts. Anyone else before we move on? I think all these have been really great that have been suggested. I think another two that I would think about is one affirmation and legitimization of the needs of the requests. You know, when we had um, large companies asking for money, they did it boldly and proudly with no same attached to their ask for more money. And I think oftentimes when it comes to minoritized or smaller people or people in lower socioeconomic status, even regards to race, there's this shame that's associated with asking. And so I think it is legitimizing and affirming the reality of the needs and that these are natural, these are unfortunate times. And quite frankly, these are needs that have been created from oppression and uh, this equitable distribution of resources slash um, this equitable access of resources. And so taking it so that it's not a you problem that you may have needs during this crisis and during this pandemic would be something that I think is a high priority that gives a lot of spillover to like mental health, to affirmation, to be able to self-advocate, to have that confidence to walk with your head held high. And then I think the second would be actually giving resources. We know when it comes to health, a lot of the unfortunate negative health outcomes and diseases can be mitigated by just providing some of the basic necessities of human living, having food, having shelter, having a secure place where you're not in a constant state of fight or flight or stress because you don't know if it's safe to be there. You're having to always worry about something, someone to come in to rob you. And so I think providing those resources to give a strong, solid foundation of the basic needs being met and giving those in ways that don't um, dehumanize or in ways that continue to allow them to be affirmed in their humanity are two things that would be great priorities. I have to echo that. Certainly all of you have said some, some great uh, point or made some great points. Uh, you know, when, when we're taking care of patients, we have to take care of the whole patient. Uh, you know, what we see when we're interacting with them is just the tip of the iceberg. And so to Dr. Smyer's point, uh, certainly engaging our, our um, social workers and other uh, 
uh, healthcare providers or medical professionals that can assist with providing resources that are needed. Certainly the extra stress, that is also a risk factor for uh, developing some of these disease states. And so that's why we see these disparities in, in you know, minoritized communities. If you're riding in your car and you're fearful of losing your life potentially, if you are pulled over by a police, that's stress, stress that unfortunately privileged individuals don't have to worry about. And so I totally agree that um, it, it's important for us to provide the resources. And also as it relates to, to resources, mental health, that, that's important for us to, to address um, because of the trauma, to, um, the trauma that, that all of these potential factors can, can elicit. Dr. Cruz, do you wanna have any comments on that question? Actually, I raised my hand because I wanted to ask you what your perspective was, but you gave it. So thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, we actually have another question that is coming and I think it's a good one. It, it says that, you know, we see racists have infiltrated law enforcement, politics and et cetera. There's a growing concern. Concerning their infiltration in the medical profession, how do you address this issue in your various departments? And I'll just start off that Yes, because racism is certainly what I consider to be threaded throughout um, our, our country um, or woven throughout our, our country and in so many ways, there are definitely racist on all of our campuses. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that maybe even some of us have encountered racist in our departments. I think it's important when someone shows you who they are believe them and not, and, and also calling, I think it's important to call them out as well. Um, so that, you know, oftentimes when I hear certain things or someone says something that's racist, first off, you know, I share that, um, I share my thoughts about it, um, but I also ask questions and I, op I ask open-ended questions so that I can understand their thought process. And that leads to a conversation. And that's the whole purpose of, of these particular conversations. We have to make racist individuals feel uncomfortable on our campuses. And I think ultimately that is the goal, but we have to allow them to show who they are. Once again, like I said, when they show you who they are, believe them. Um, but it's important that they they don't harm individuals. So that will not be tolerated. And if there is any harm or any specific microaggressions and, and biases that are displayed, that needs to be reported. And it's important that we all on our campuses have uh, modalities that these types of, of encounters can actually be reported. So if any of our other panelists have any thoughts on how to address racist individuals that may be infiltrated into the medical profession? Well, I would start by actually saying it's not that they've infiltrated because the infiltration means you're on the outside and now you work your way in. But if you look at how the country was built and framed, it was built on racist policy. So it's not so much that they're the ones infiltrating. In fact, it's the minoritized and other people who are infiltrated into these areas to now disrupt the previous power systems that were at work. And so with that in mind, I think we have to be open and honest about engaging and how we evolve moving forward and owning that the way it used to be was probably racist and built off of those same tendencies. So we can't assume it started off good and it's a good thing that needs minor modifications. In fact, we should probably assume it was not built in the best ideal way with our current values. So maybe we need to rethink and reframe and rebuild it. And that rebuilding may go several layers deep. I think when it comes to engaging people, a model that works really well for me is identifying the specific behavior that's problematic, whether that was tone, the words that were used and, it, and expressing the impact it had because only you will know the direct impact someone's behavior has on you. We all may be able to identify and see a specific behavior, and I don't need you to tell me if you hit me. I can say you hit me. Matter of fact, the camera just saw you hit me. 
I can tell you how that landed for me and what that made me feel like. And only you as the individual can share your intention. Were you hitting me because you got excited and you meant to do it in a celebratory way? Were you hitting me because it was a startle reflex and I surprised you? And so being able to say, hey, you just hit me and I didn't like it because it made me feel this way. What was your intention? Because it gives them now a space to explain themselves. It also brings it to their awareness so that it can't go, I didn't realize this was disrespectful or harmful. And oftentimes people feel like if I'm telling you the way it landed on me, I'm directly telling what you intended, but those are mutually exclusive. So I can only know your intentions by sharing. So if you intended to congratulate me, I would say, hey, I'm actually better and receive it better with congratulations when they're done in words or send me an email to congratulate me or clap your hands, but don't touch me in a celebratory way because that does not make me feel celebrated. And so when you express that, now they have that awareness. Now they are accountable to that. And then if someone does continue to behave in ways that make you feel uncomfortable um, in ways that are racist, we do have, at least at the Springfield site, a um, bias response team and where we can file reports that can be looked into and have a proper response um, from an institutional level. One, if new policy is being created, and two, on the individual level, making sure the individual who was offended is supported and reassured and protected, but also going to the, off the offender and doing some education slash other disciplinary acts, depending on the actual events that occurred. So our time is starting to wind up and I, I just want to echo um, what Dr. Smyer said um, as it relates to reporting these incidents and understanding that intent and impact can be two different things. And it's important that you recognize the impact. Um, certainly you can share the intent, but impact is, is so important. You know, I'm reminded of this, uh, it's called the platinum rule versus the golden rule. We hear of the golden rule of that we treat others as we want to be treated. But ultimately the platinum rule says that we treat others how they want to be treated. And that comes from actually getting to know the individuals. And that's the purpose of us in being in community and learning, as you mentioned, what does this look like? Or what does this feel like when you say these certain things and not being defensive about it? I had uh, one more question before we end with our closing remarks. Um, and this is for Dr. Ewing. You specifically talked about um, education and as you were giving your priority areas, um, can you talk about any particular literature that education actually does remove racial distrust? Mm -hmm. um, I can't. Um, off the top of my head, um, quote any literature. What I can do is tell you about my own experience firsthand with patients. Um, I have found that when I encounter someone that has a hesitancy, a fear, has not sought care uh, when it was clearly needed, um, and will take time out and sit and talk with them, explore their uh, concerns, reassure them that their concerns are valid, and then provide information on um, what one thought was being presented to them and then the way that they received it. And attempt to help them um, mesh the two, to have a different view of, um, of what the possibilities are for themselves and for their care. Um, and anecdotally, the, I have found that to be extremely successful, particularly if patients have the opportunity to, to develop a long-term relationship with their health system, with their particular medical provider. Um, you can work with the patient over time, um, presenting them with information that is um, forthright, uh, that is sensitive to their cultural needs. Um, and I have seen that steady flow of information as the patient is ready to take it in, actually be successful. And the patient departing from you um, when that relationship comes to an end, ready and prepared to be their own advocate as they move to the next system or next um, provider. 
All right, thank you so much. So, you know, this has been a, a great conversation and we've talked about the long history of abuse and present day medical racism. Racism is a disparate untreated disease in my opinion that has been silent in one, in one group and deadly in another group for far too long. You know, I, I think about, we, we're also talking about the vaccine if only we actually had a vaccine for racism too. So with that said, I, I want to share that we have received a number of comments in the chat thanking the panelists for the insightful information that has been shared. Also thanking the SIU, SIU system for having this conversation this, this evening. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to President Mahoney for his closing remarks. You know, first of all, I want to say thank you to the community, the SIU community that's joined us for this conversation. Again, you know, part of the reason we put this on is to have you all be part of it. And, and obviously a lot of great questions tonight. So I appreciate your participation. Uh, thank you to the panelists. As you can see, we are fortunate to have a lot of expertise. Um, haven't always been at universities that have had med schools and pharmacy schools and all of the different people we have here today. Uh, we've been very fortunate and I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, I, I want to take the opportunity again to thank our faculty um, and staff for how they've done over the last uh, nearly year in managing through everything we've had to manage through. And I particularly want to thank our students. Um, I can tell you the number of people who told me that our students would not behave well, they wouldn't follow rules, and they wouldn't do things, really owe them an apology. Um, if the country had behaved the way the SIU students have behaved, we'd be in a lot better shape and we would not have 400,000 people dead right now. So again, thank you to them for, for all that they did. I'm actually doing a conference presentation tomorrow um, about how we've managed through all of this. And, and I was thinking about some of the things we thought about as we were trying to figure out things during the spring and, and into the fall semester and really into this spring semester. And, and there were really five things that we often thought about. What is best for the health and safety of our community? That was an overriding factor. Um, I like the concept of grace and understanding. That was a theme that we talked about, not just at SIUE, but across the system of making sure that we were treating our employees and thinking about all the issues they were dealing with, both at work and home and, and trying to do things to help our students out, um, that we needed to stay operational. We I always point out, we never shut down. Uh, we just changed the way we did our business. Um, and that was critical both for our students to be able to continue to make progress onto their careers but also for us to basically survive as a, as a university system. Um, the educational quality was a big overriding factor for us, We're trying to do the best we could in this situation for our students. And social justice and equity was also a theme that we constantly looked at everything we were doing. That's how would this affect all of our students? How will this affect all of our employees? And trying to make sure that we weren't doing things that based on our own experiences, not understanding how it would affect others. Um, as you can quickly see, the challenge was these things were sometimes in conflict. Um, so it took a lot of conversation to figure out how do we work through it, um, particularly when we were getting constantly changing advice. And I, and I will say, I did my best not to get a medical degree from Facebook University um, and not believe everything that I read online. Um, but I had the fortunate um, ability to go to Dean Cruz or when we were doing the fall 2020 task force, uh, Vidya Prakash, uh, doctor in our medical school who focuses on infectious disease was incredibly helpful to me. And so I always went to them with anything I read and said, you know, can help me work through this. Um, so again, we were lucky to have the expertise we did. You know, things like we've had tonight discussions, I think it's, I, I'm a teacher in the classroom still, and what part of what I teach is history. And I think we can't understand how to deal with our current issues unless we understand how we got here. And I think what the panelists did tonight really well was give us some sense of the history, both the long-term history of hundreds of years of oppression and how that impacted and all of the medical issues that have come up over time, you know, from way back to the Tuskegee experiments, but really even history, I always say is history is yesterday too. Um, it's what happened six months ago. It's the, as Dr. Butler talked about, the double death rate for, for blacks is now affecting also how they're seeing the medical profession as we're trying to work through the next stage and the vaccines and everything else. And so we have to, as we're trying to figure this out, understand that that's all there. Um, I like the, how you explained it well, this concept of race versus racism. When I teach class, I always, in sports, we always try to give biological explanations to things that are clearly sociological explanations. Um, and we need to be clear that those things are different. And that's clearly been the case with all of this. Um, I think what came up multiple times 
Dr. Smyra, I think, mentioned it first, but I think multiple people is the importance of trust um, and the importance at this point of building trust. That was hopeful, hopefully what we did a little bit today. Today, And again, it's even more important when we reflect on that history of where trust was really, um, there's lots of reasons to have that distrust uh, based on things that have happened in the past. So building that back up, I think Dr. Smyra said it well, it's you know, telling what we do know and what frankly we don't know um, and being clear that we are still learning. Uh, people have asked me often, what is August going to look like? I don't know yet. That's the honest truth. I don't know how many vaccines we'll have. I don't know how many people will get vac vaccinated. We are pushing as hard as we can to get people in the system vaccinated, but we don't know exactly what things are going to look like. And that's just being honest. And I think we need to continue to be honest if we're going to have that trust. I actually decided I wasn't going to talk about this, but it came up so many times, this concept of allyship. Um, and I thought, you know, what Dr. Butler said was true. Um, it's not given. And I actually think it's never really earned. Um, I've been at five different universities where I've done safe zone training um, to be an ally. Um, and I always get the sticker that says I'm supposed to put this on my door and say I'm an ally. And I want to do that because I want to be welcoming and make people feel like they belong and they can talk with me. Um, but I always feel like I should put next to it aspiring ally that I'm always trying to learn. And I, the reason I've gone through five trainings is every time I learn something new and I learn more and I try to understand better. And I think that's true whether you're talking about the LGBTQIA community or you're dealing with the African-American community or the Latinx community or any group that you're talking about, you're constantly learning new things and aspiring to learn more so that you can do better in your role. And I think for a lot of us, what we're really focused on is trying to provide better access and equity and access. And whether that's education, healthcare, or whatever it is, and there's always more things we can do. Clearly, as we've talked about today, we're nowhere close to where we would like to be. There's still a lot of work to be done. I think there's going to continue to be lots of struggles going forward. Uh, I think Dr. Smyer said it well. The system is what it has been for a long period of time. And some of the move, the changes that we're seeing are actually causing more people to be outspoken against those very changes that are focused on increasing equity. Um, and we have to recognize that that's probably going to continue. But there needs to continue to be conversations like we've had today. Um, and I think those conversations, Dr. Butler talked about having individual conversations group conversations are really critical on making progress. So once again, I want to thank the panelists, um, not just for their participation today, but the expertise they provided to the SIU system through all of this. And, and have, I hope you all have a good night.